All right. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. cheers. Welcome to Happy Hour. This week, I am excited that Andy is joining us because, um, and I don't know if I told you, Andy, this, we started this with um, Corona because we figured people needed happy hour. <laughs> and we went through all the wines and then we started, um, we had a bunch of questions. So we started bringing other people in to answer questions of our um, illustrious happy hour crew. And um, Robin, who is having dinner is um, <laughs> wanted to know about ampelography. So I am, which I had suggested, but I wasn't good. <laughs> That's a good question because the three most commonly mixed up varieties are Cab, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc, and Merlot. So, <laughs> well, and that actually, so every week we do a wine and we do the food pairing. And I said, what wine are we going to do? What makes sense? And I'm going to say the hardest varietals. In, that I still can't tell the difference apart reliably between Cab Cap Franc and Merlot, but we put them together in the carriage house. <laughs> so Very one nice. of the pop questions is, how do you tell the difference in the leaves of these three varietals? Yeah, that's a good question. And I then, um, <laughs> so the, um, one of the other reasons that I wanted to pick the carriage house is because I think it's a good example of how Grapevines that evolve together are classically, um, they're blended together, but they also kind of work in the same, the same temperature profiles, the same environments. And one of the, I thought this was a good reminder to um, go back to our vineyard picture that we haven't looked at in a while. So we'll go back to our, our vineyard shot and remind everybody that actually Adrish, Pop quiz time, where's carriage house? Unmute uh, yourself. Old, old garbanzo fields, right? <laughs> <laughs> where's the carriage house come from? Oh, uh, you're killing me. Yeah. Uh, isn't it, it, so like the, the like hillside and then is the cab and then the like Merlot is below it? Like here? Sure. That's coat. Ah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> then then the only thing that's left is like the stuff on, on the whatever, on the right. On Down the right here. as I'm looking at the screen. Yeah. Yes. But both this area and this area are Bordeaux varietals. And then the reminder is that on that back here, where it's north facing, that it's a different different micro environment. And that's why we put the Chardonnay there and the Syrah over here, which is also a little different because it's west, southwest facing. And um, because all these things evolved in different places, they evolved to, to um, thrive in different climates. And it's one of the things that's really cool about Washington and our vineyard is that you can grow them all so closely together. So, um, and then for our food pairing, because some things live all involved closely together and other things evolve because we travel and we move around and we share things and including food. Mom came up with these. The Moorish pork kebabs. So um, Carrie says, we need to have a, a French appetizer. And I said, Carrie, we don't have any escargot <laughs> or pate. I'm not making that. So it was a little tough. So I said, can we move over to Spain maybe and get a little, little cultural influence? So we thought um, that and the kebabs are easy. You can do them for dinner or you can do them for appetizers. So, um, and I thought the spices on this would go really well with carrot chow. So we're um, experimenting as always. Uh, and I always think of the warm spices, like, of course, with the Indian food in the drish with carriage house. And this has got a lot of those similar sort of um, flavors. Oh, so that that's why we picked the pork kebabs, even though we're, they're pork Moorish, because as we know, the Moors didn't eat pork, but you know, that's the ish part. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> it's a little bit of a stretch, but <laughs> anyways, enjoy. And, and the 12, it should pair well because the 12 vintage, which is that classic middle of the road growing season in Washington, um, 
which was Adrisha's favorite with the Indian spices. Then um, <laughs> we should use Adrisha's zoom out. Yes, we should use Adrisha. Should just give a vineyard tour virtually on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> you need a little drone. You could fly around up there. <laughs> so it was. Um, 12 was, like I said, a pretty typical growing year. I was looking at heat units the other day, and this year we are um, behind the 12 year. This year, this spring is shaping up significantly cooler than the 12 vintage. But um, so we're going to turn it over to Dad to talk about the vineyard. And I have to unmute him. There you go. You're ready. You bet. First of all, um, we need to tip our hat to Andy. If you give him an introduction about who he really is, instead of just a wonderful <laughs> guest here, um, he's one of <laughs> Carrie's props from Davis, who uh, loves vineyard, and we do too. And so, uh, on the vineyard picture that Carrie showed, one of the very distinctive elements in our vineyard is that the Cabernet that goes into the carriage house is the same clone. It's the Cabernet that goes into the coat, but because of where they grow, they're very different. And so the same clone, different terroir, and different wines. So then if you want to show the Syrah picture from the vineyard. So Andy, what we've done is feature one segment of a vine. Uh, we do Syrah, same segment, week after week after week, and show mm -hmm. how it's developing. Mm -hmm. And what we had been tracking so far was uh, the set of the fruit after bloom. And uh, when Carrie enlarges the center of that picture, you can see the, the Syrah berries and how they've uh, been developing compared to um, how they had been previously when they still had. We had Fuse Calyptra and uh, the weeks before that, it had been kind of an extended bloom. But then if you step back and look at something that um, has been a revelation to us this year, it's about the terroir of this particular block of grapes, which is uh, based on a very rocky promontory. And uh, we had known that there were three levels of uh, soil accumulation. The topmost part had been windswept for centuries. Uh, but uh, deposition had occurred down at the base of it. So you have uh, completely different growing conditions top to bottom. But then we had a very hot spell last week and vines that we had not known were uh, at risk have shown themselves. And on the left-hand side, you see the vine that's just a little bit uphill, doesn't have the canopy development, doesn't have the shoot length. Um, and those vines, became apparent that they were stressed. And in the 70 years that um, the rose irrigation lateral had been above these vines, there had been enough water subbing out of the lateral to keep these vines uh, comparable to the ones a little bit further down the slope. But three years ago, when they uh, took the water out of the lateral and put it into pipes to save, uh, to conserve water, uh, we had a wet spring last year and these vines didn't show any stress. Well, this year we had a dry winter, dry spring, and it's been dry so far. And uh, with the 98 degree high last week and all week long was in the 90s, over 93, all of a sudden these vines said, my God, <laughs> I'm dry. And so our response was to go down the hill a little bit, put uh, cutoff valve in and put extra emitters in above that and then we uh, isolated that particular upper part of the hillside to give it more water and the vines are showing by their response that um, they feel a whole lot better than they did but anyway uh, the terroir on this particular hillside is very striking for those of you that have been to the vineyard and have walked that hill you know the difference from the bottom to the top Okay, Kara, then you want to go to the cab. So the Cabernet vines, you can see a lot more uniform uh, shoot development. The ladies have come through with their um, shoot thinning. The catch wires are up, holding the shoots vertical on the morning side. The, um, the fruit that you can see on the left-hand group of shoots 
uh, is adjacent to the one that we had been tracking initially, which has very little fruit on it. But overall, this will even out. And Kara, can you get a little closer uh, and show the berries on the clusters? Um, they're a lot better developed. And um, Cabernet this year looks like it's a very happy vine uh, in our vineyard and uh, from what I gather across the state. So anyway, we're making progression. The berries are becoming a lot more defined and um, we're rocking along. So that's my report. Okay, so basically the cab's looking good and that Syrah up at the top of the hill was, is getting more water and gonna catch up to the rest of the catch up to the rest of everything else. So um, with that. You gotta unmute me. I will, okay. You're muted, you're done. You're <laughs> off. <laughs> the, um, the, okay, so Andy, I'm supposed to introduce you. I went and I had like, I don't know how to introduce, I don't know what to say. So I went and I looked at the, I went and looked at the uh, Davis website and it basically told me everything that I knew that was relevant, or which is basically as a plant geneticist and a grape breeder, um, Andy also teaches a couple of classes about the introduction to viticulture. But um, so- Three it, of them now, by the way. Three of them? Yeah, they're trying to kill me off before I retire. <laughs> well, that's because all the students need all of your knowledge. <laughs> so um, it's, I mean, a lot of us think about, especially as wine drinkers, but even as wine industry people, we think about where grape, what grapes are, not necessarily where they came from, how they evolved. And like, for example, one of the reasons that Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc are so hard to tell apart is that Franc is the parent to Sauvignon. And so the leaves look really similar. Um, and so how all of these things evolved and came to be, and then what is, where are we going in the future um, with changes in disease pressure and just evolution continues to happen. And so what do we do with that? We need, we need new grape varieties, we need new rootstocks, um, things like that. And those are all things that Andy's been working on for years. So is that good enough? Yeah, that's plenty. Okay, cool. It's mostly true. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, now things are just starting now, and here I am, <laughs> and we're, they're not rehiring me yet for a while. So I was, I started telling the department about two years ago that I was going to retire in uh, 2011 or 21, 11. That was even longer ago, in 2021, and uh, I haven't made a lot of progress. And the, the, of course, the state's finances have slipped, and university's finances have slipped even more. So who knows when it's happening next? So I may just do it on, on my own. <laughs> well, I heard you just released some uh, Pierce's disease resistant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Five new PD resistant varieties. They're very nice. Um, Chuck Wagner's become our most fervent uh, apostle of, of Camus. He's gone nuts. In fact, he's planning them where he shouldn't be planning them, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, they're doing well against PD in a bunch of places from Ojai up to uh, through the Napa River and um, Dry Creek, lots of spots, lots of hot, hot spots. Excellent. It's exciting. Cool. Do you have slides that I need to let you share? Nope. nope. I thought I'd just go without slides because I lost them. So this is easier. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as bad as that. So, uh, so I guess the if you want to talk about ampelography, we should start at the beginning, which is before people um, and before humans entered into the fertile crescent, more or less. Um, at that point, there were grapevines growing all across Central Asia, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, North Africa. There were wild grapevines, and, and those progenitor types are actually still there. They're pretty uncommon because of disease and phylloxera pressure and things, but there are these four major centers of origin of, of uh, vinifera grapes. And one is Central Asia. Those are mostly table grape types that, that evolved from that. Even the ones that are used for wine production are, are much more table grape like in appearance, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute or two. And then there's the far Western European stuff, which really sort of is a small, more struggling sort of vine, very different morphology, but, but consistent across the types that are Western European. 
And then there's the Eastern European stuff that's sort of halfway in between the Western European stuff and the Central Asian material. And then there's the North African stuff, which is really interesting because that was the major trade route that brought stuff across at that point. So it sprinkled stuff up into Italy and went all the way across to, to, uh, to Spain and, and France and, and um, sort of moved that route as well. So those are the major, major groupings. Uh, and they still exist. And, and in fact, Vavilov, who's sort of the father of, of, uh, of plant domestication from the late 1900s, or, or early 1900s, late 1800s, um, defined those groupings at that point too and started saying, well, these things all look very similar. And it was sort of neat when I went, I finished my bachelor's in 75 and went off to work in nurseries in various places and was gonna work in, in, uh, in vineyards and apple orchards after I finished my master's in horticulture there when I went back to school. But I went back to school after eight years. And the funniest thing was the thing that's still occurring. Um, so when I was a taxonomist for my bachelor's degree and a completely useless degree, even more useless in poetry probably, <laughs> and I uh, couldn't get a job. So I, I did other things for a while. And when I back, went back to school, I sort of missed the whole blooming of the molecular genetic era. And it was so funny because they were applying these skills to, to groups of taxonomically related plants, which we're still doing in many ways, and, um, and saying, yeah, and, and look, they look the same too. And, and, and this matches what we know about the genetics now. I said, well, gosh, we knew about morphology first and sort of dictates the whole thing. And it's a good lesson because really all that combined information you get by looking at, at a plant from a, a distant, uh, a greater distance and the whole plant distance um, really is the phenotype, right? It's, it's the interaction of all the genes and all the environments and everything else sort of portraying its footprint on, on what that variety is. And it's really true. And it, it's, it's, it's sort of cool overall, I think. So, and who knows what they're going to think of next is to prove the same thing once again. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Uh, those same techniques are also being used in grape breeding now. So there's going to be a lot of advances that move forward, I think. Uh, and a lot of potential we're moving forwards. The problem is people, right? They're completely stuck in this idea that we shouldn't be improving grapevines. Uh, and we've gone from a common usage of probably a hundred varieties around the world to a really condensed usage of maybe 10 to 15 uh, that are really the vast majority of, of the acreage on the planet at this point, which is sad. And when you travel, the, the most discouraging thing you'll ever hear, I think, is you get to a winery and they go, here, here, come in the back. I've got these really nice things. These are, try my Cabernet, try my Merlot. I said, no, I want to try the local indigenous varieties. I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't need those. And it's always a, an interesting movement uh, with, with these materials. And it's, it's sad that it's become so condensed and, and there's less diversity than we thought. Um, in reality, there's tremendous diversity. There's probably, it depends on who you ask, somewhere between 1,200 and 5,000 different wine grape varieties, um, probably closer to 500, let alone, let alone uh, 5,000. But it, it's, uh, it's open for, for, for debate. And part of the problem is they're all, the, when you start studying them, they're all inter, interrelated, which is sort of cool. So they, they cluster into those four big groups, first of all. And then within those four big groupings, you have all sorts of other clusters. And again, they look like they should be clustered together. So the, the, uh, the North African stuff, well, let's, let's start with the last. Let's start with the Western European. That's the easiest. The smallest leaf, the least lobed, um, the smaller sinuses, the smaller teeth, generally less tomentum, less hair on the back of the leaves, smaller berries, usually almost always round berries, and smaller clusters. And they're pretty distinctive. And you could think of them from being anywhere from, from Chardonnay and Riesling to, to Pinot Noir to um, uh, even Syrah to some extent, if it sort of falls in there as well, it sort of, it sort of drifts into um, yeah, East, Eastern Europe if you think about them. And then we move across the, the, the Western Europe and into the um, Eastern European things, they become larger tooth, the, the teeth are larger. The backside of the leaf has often got a fair amount of tomentum on it, not tons necessarily, but a fairly, fairly tomentose. Uh, the berries are larger and, and they start turning towards oval instead of round. The clusters are larger and, and they uh, considerably larger, twice the size oftentimes, and, and really quite distinctive in that regard too. Generally, the berries are, are bigger too at the same time. Um, and that moves across to, to, to Central Asia. And the Central Asian stuff is great big, huge teeth, great big floppy leaves, very uh, indescribable almost. They're, they don't have 
sort of normal uh, lobing and venation and, and patterns to them. They're just big floppy things. And if, if you've seen table grapes, that's what you're thinking about. Uh, even Thompson seedless has the same, same sort of appearance to it. So those all fit together in that, that big grouping. Um, and then we have the North African stuff that, that uh, really uh, ended up probably causing the most confusion that this exists in ampelography today. And then those materials are a little bit Eastern European in appearance, not quite as, as irregular uh, in terms of teeth and structure, but sharper teeth, larger teeth, uh, usually quite large clusters. And, and um, it ranges anything from Tempranillo. I don't know if you're growing Tempranillo is a very distinctive grape from that perspective in terms of the leaf size and the teeth and the uh, pimentum berry shape, all those things fit together too. So that, that's, it's not so bad once you start looking at these things from that perspective. The trouble is really deciding what two closely related grapes are is not always very easy. Uh, in fact, it can be very difficult. And um, one of the nice things about the trends in genetics right now is the, and particularly in, in virology, which is going on with our friend, the, the COVID, uh, is very rapid detection kits. And within a couple of years, probably, if they wanted to take any portion of that, <laughs> maybe once we get it solved, <clears throat> There was some enterprising medical geneticists who will say, I love wine, I want to use this tool for identification of wine grape varieties. And um, it could probably be done in sort of like an afternoon. Just take, take a little bit of zap and dip it on the dipstick essentially, and it'll say yes, no, or maybe for probably up to 100 varieties that you could, you could guess, and you'd get most of the world's varieties in that way. So it would be sort of a nice tool. Put all the amplographers out of business, then, and they're all going to be dead anyway, so it doesn't really matter <laughs> from that perspective too. So it's... Um, it, it's interesting, and, and the neat thing again is they all look very, very similar. And so the Cabernet you're drinking tonight, or mostly Cabernet, I'm assuming it's, it's more than 50% Cab, tastes sort of in the 60% range, it's nice, very, yes. very pleasant. Um, nice, nice tannin structure, and, uh, not overly tannic, which I'm, I'm tired of, but not, not overly fruity, not overly alcoholic, and has a nice balance to it, it's really, I think, quite pleasant. Um, so Merlot is that, is that second donor in the, in the blend? Mm -hmm. And then Cabernet Franc, a little touch at the end. Yeah, it's, it's very good, pretty tasty. So Merlot is, or Cabernet Franc is, is, or Cabernet Sauvignon is notable because it was the first variety that was really identified through genetic markers. And, and these uh, simple sequence repeat markers allow you to actually distinguish parents to some degree and, and to make the decision that yes, these all fit together and we can actually determine what they are. And that was done by Carol Meredith, who was mostly my MIG professor through my PhD. And... Um, that was her claim to fame, although it was wrong, largely. <laughs> Completely wrong, just different. Uh, and that's because grapes, uh, she, she wasn't thinking about grapes as grapevines, as wild plants. She was thinking about them as cultivated plants, which is good, that's where she started out with. And in the wild, grapevines are either male or female. They're in the cultivated forms, they're all hermaphroditic, except for a few handfuls of, of uh, female varieties that, that don't have any um, stamens on them, essentially, or non-functional stamens. So there, there's a female group, there's a male group in the wild, and they have these exerted stamens and very, very limited pistil development. So they're, they're functionally, they're non-functional as, 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 as a female, although they do have uh, reduced um, female parts. Uh, and the, the wild grapes, or, or the cultivated grapes, of course, are hermaphroditic. They're both strong pistil development and strong stamen development, but they have both sexes and they self-pollinate. They self so that, that's really the key to the whole discovery, right? So where did all these grapes come from? Uh, and when did they come from somewhere? And they probably started coming from somewhere around, and here's another big debate about who's right and wrong about all these things. And so in my opinion, why would you think, why is there any reason to believe the Fertile Crescent didn't really evolve and develop into 15 or 20,000 years ago? It could have been a whole lot longer time than that. And there's just no evidence of it, right? And, and the, what developed was agriculture. And what really developed more importantly than agriculture was the cultivation of plants and, and the recognition that they could be improved. See where I'm going right now? I'm getting you back to the great breeding section here. So you'll become apostles for great breeding at the end here. Um, and it could have been a very long time ago and it probably could have been a short time ago, but it was certainly more than several hundred years ago and certainly probably more than 500 or 1,000 years ago because some of these things go back in, in published works that go back uh, a thousand years in, in strange, bizarre Central Asian <laughs> languages and things. So we, we think that there's quite an ancient pedigree, pedigree to the whole, whole thing. So where are we going with that? So in the wild, we have male vines and female vines, and they are um, 
maleness is we can call it big M, little M, and femaleness is is uh, little f, little f. We can think of all these things if we want, but the femaleness is recessive, and it's uh, to be a female grapevine, you have to be homozygous recessive, and to be a male grapevine, you could be either homozygous male or you could be heterozygous male. You could be big M, little little, little f, or whatever you want to designate them as to, to, to determine. Um, what that sex would be, but essentially you'd be functionally male, but you possess uh, female alleles. So if you had, were crossed together, there's a chance of getting some females out of that cross. And that, that, that would be the case. But in the wild, so in the wild, all these grapes are, are heterozygous. And they're heterozygous because they're dioecious. And what does dioecious mean? It means there's male flowers and female flowers. And it means that they're obligate outcrossers, just like people. In fact, grapevine genetics is a whole lot like human genetics and animal genetics because grapevines are migratory. Uh, they move abundantly in the wild and birds are their primary dispersal agent. That's why grapes are there in the first place, not just to make nice wine, but to attract the birds. Uh, and they flew off of these things and, and, and moved them. And over generations, those plants became populations in, in given areas. But in the wild, you rarely see female vines. If I take those two wild grapes, a male grape and a female grape, and cross them and put them, I put all the progeny in my vineyard. Every single time, they're 50/50, just like humans. Uh, the, the, we're 50/50 male female, and and grapes are 50/50 male female as well. But in the wild, they're all all the females are gone. So how did that happen? Uh, it happened because grapevines have a tremendous, or fruit is a tremendous photosynthetic load. It takes a lot of energy to mature that crop. So when those grapes first fruit. If they're in a difficult environment or, or a hostile spot or there's not enough irrigation or their water mains have cracked and they haven't gone through and put their emitters back in again, <laughs> all those things could have occurred. Um, and those female grapes die. They don't survive. And the male, male grapes, all they have to do is wander around and shed pollen and life is good and they have no responsibilities. It looks, again, sounds a whole lot like human genetics again. So um, uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon. So that's where this all came from. And so how do we get back to that part? Well, how do the grapes get pollinated? You've seen uh, grapes flowering. There's a little cap that pops off uh, at bloom. That cap effectively prevents pollen from blowing in from another source because it shields it. Because it doesn't pop open, it pops off. So it lips off and, and uh, is, is discarded. And as soon as it cracks at the base there, pollen is, is shed from the, from the anthers and they self-pollinate. Okay, so they're, they're not 100% soil pollinated, but they're pretty close. And um, oftentimes they're 99%, sometimes 95, 90, 90, 91 or 2%, but they're highly selfed. Uh, when they self, remember back in the wild again now. So yeah, we can go back even further to human genetics again. Uh, back when civilization started to be uh, developed and, and there was more control over pe people's ad ad attitudes and, and um, uh, activities, um, it became clear that things like marrying your brother and sister was a bad idea. And why? Not because of religious tenets of things, but because there were no progeny if you did that. <laughs> they were all weak and they were, they were scrawny and they didn't develop properly. They couldn't pull the hoe and the plow and all the rest. All that stuff sort of came together at the same time. And grapes are the same. So if you self-pollinate a grapevine, you can, if it's hermaphroditic, uh, you get very few progeny. In fact, one of the first things I did to prove to myself was, was that I, I selfed uh, clusters of of, of Chardonnay, Cabernet, and, and a grape called, and Riesling, and a grape called Aramon as well, to see what would happen. And in the Cabernet, I, I started out with a thousand seeds uh, that were developed. And I took those seeds, and no more than half of those seeds uh, uh, sunk. So to test them for viability, we put them in buckets of water, and if, they, if the fruit and the seeds drop to the bottom, they're fertile. Uh, and if they stay on top and float, then we discard them. They're not fertile. Uh, so no more than half were sinkers. And of that batch that sunk, no more than half germinated. And of the ba batch that germinated, no more than half grew properly. And of the part that didn't <laughs> that grew properly from there, uh, was, was sprouted out, it, it didn't develop properly either. And then, in fact, it became chlorotic and they mostly died. So out of that thousand seeds, I ended up with 34 plants. Uh, every one of them looked like you'd taken 2,4-D and Roundup to it to spray it and to try to contort it. Uh, and, but there was one gray-fruited Cabernet Sauvignon that I was always very interested in and, and lost in the vineyard a few years later. But it looked just like Cabernet. It acted like Cabernet. It was the one individual that sort of balanced all those recessive alleles that were carried and exposed by something. Again, same reason we don't marry our brothers and sisters. There might, it might be better to achieve, move forwards in some regards, but you'd have to be very careful. 
So that's where those things came from. And the wild grapes are, are very heterozygous. And as a result, the cultivated forms, which haven't been cultivated very long, are also very heterozygous. And if you think back now, if you've had any plant genetics or crop domestication, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, what about all those people back there in Central Asia uh, in the Fertile Crescent? They were selling things like peas and lentils and all sorts of other things to, and, and improving upon plants. And most of our cultivated plants, particularly the ones that form the, the mainstay of our food production, uh, are self-fertile. And, and they're not only self-fertile, they're mostly homozygous. And they come through to type. So if you go back to your heirloom tomatoes and you put them out in your, in your backyard, if you were growing green zebra this year and you save those seeds, it's the same green zebra next year. But if you take your better boy with VFN nematode protection and virus protection, and you have to have it in my backyard, or the plants die from all the diseases I brought out there over the years. Um, if, if you take that and self it and, and save that seed, it all, it's all irregular. In fact, most of them are, are crummy tasting cherry, cherry tomatoes when you do that. So it's interesting. That's exactly the same thing that happens to people and the same thing that happens to, to grapes. They don't breed true to type because they're so heterozygous and there's so much diversity in their backgrounds. So that's the good news. It means that you can make very rapid advances in, in grape improvement through classical breeding. And, and uh, it's really remarkably fast. So if you go out now and take a book out and, and look up Time Takes to Breed Grapes, I don't know if you could, probably it's on the internet or maybe one of those nasty Siri things could figure out how to, how to get to that. Uh, but, but it'll tell you that it takes five to eight years to go from seed to seed to make a generation. That means that if you're gonna breed grapes, you have to be very, very long lived or, or have a, a whole troop of people who can, can follow up on those activities too. Because eight years is a long time to wait to go for the next generation. So if you make a cross and you select the best individual and you take that seed and you grow it out again and it takes eight years to get more seed again to, so you can make another advance in that material, it's, it's not very practical. But we discovered through uh, horticultural trickery that you could convince grapes to, to um, uh, go from seed to seed in two years. Um, the first thing to recognize is that everything in between going from that first cross to the very last cross is useless. And it's not completely useless, but it's close to it. And that's important to recognize because you wouldn't want to waste your time making wine from it in those early generations because we knew the wine would be poor quality. And so that's how we got the PD stuff. We went out and we did a lot of work. We discovered uh, these surreptitiously that, that um, resistance was strong in Arizonica and Vitus Arizonica is fairly mild in terms of flavor and characteristics. And we found a source of resistance that was, was homozygous. Uh, so both genes, every plant you crossed to that plant was resistant to fierce disease and it was controlled by a single gene. Uh, so we had all the things that could really make this go quickly in one piece. So we took the first cross for the wild grape and we crossed it to vinifera and the offspring were 50% vinifera and 50% wild grape, and they didn't taste very good. Then we took the ones that look, looked mostly like vinifera, and we crossed those back to vinifera again. And in a normal plant breeding world where you have inbred parents, you, you can afford to cross back to the same parent, and therefore you would make the plant in the end largely, almost completely, whatever you decided to improve upon. So if each generation you go back to Chardonnay or Pinot or Cabernet or whatever you wanted to go to, in the end, if it, was, if it was possible, if they bred true to type and they were mostly inbred, uh, you could just add that extra gene in the background. But you can't do that with grapes. So each generation was a whole nother mixture of stuff. But we had a steady eye, <laughs> said we're gonna choose just a certain type and we kept pushing it along. So that next generation then we, we um, uh, then crossed back. So the first generation 50%, then 75, then 87 and a half, and then 94, and then 97, 98%. And that's where we are now, and that's where we're releasing. Uh, and these plants are 98% vinifera, and they're, they're about 1% rupestris and about 1% arizonica. And it's really fascinating to watch what happens between 87% and 94%. They hit the, the hallowed ground. They suddenly become like a real grapevine, not a wild species, not the sharp toothy things with a bitter astringency and the amazing uh, blue purple pigmentation, not red purple, but blue purple that signifying dicleucoside anthocyanins. Oh, Gary's getting nervous again here. Oh no, I'm hearing this all again. Uh, <laughs> um, and they actually transform themselves. It's fascinating. Uh, so that, that was the, the point at which we were able to sort of select them visually and, and chemically and in terms of wine. And we started making wine at the 94% and we made better wines at the 97%. So they, they're indistinguishable. And we, we've had, the only problem is we're making 
uh, three gallons worth of wine, five gallons worth of wine for these vintages. Uh, we've made now some commercial wines with, with larger scale wineries and um, they're, they're, holding, they're holding true. We also recognized that the, by far the most important thing was that they're resistant to fierce disease and we had to be sure they had the highest level of resistance. So what we really did with all the testing was confirm that the things that had genetic markers for resistance, so they, they were genetically resistant to fierce disease according to the, the markers, the same markers we used to follow parents were the same markers we used to follow the, the presence of the, the resistance gene. And um, by, by doing that, um, we, we could speed up the whole process because we could test the whole population with these, uh, for, for these markers. And if they didn't have them, we threw them away. We didn't waste any time with that stuff. And then we grew them up and we looked at them and said, these look like wine grapes, but we threw the rest away. <laughs> and then we took the last few when we got through the generations and said, these might actually make good wine, they taste good. And, and in fact, uh, ETS did a whole bunch of uh, juice assays for us over the years that dramatically improved the speed at which we went through these populations too. So that, that was a, a nice benefit as well. So now that's where we are with the stuff. We have five varieties. We have one that's cab-like. Um, we have one that's Pinot-like, more or less. Uh, you could, some people would call it Zin-like, which is interesting. Uh, so it's sort of in, in between, and it has the same sort of tannin structure oftentimes if you don't overly, overly ripen it, um, uh, which, which happens with Zin too often too. Again, more, more uh, prejudice on my part. Uh, and then um, the last one is a lot like Petit Syrah. And then there are two whites, one that's more like, more or less like Sauvignon Blanc and one that's more or less like Sauvignon Blanc with a little bit of Chardonnay in it. <laughs> so, and lo and behold, the last parent in each one of those crosses. So what happens if you've made your, all these crosses and you get to the 94% and you say, okay, I'm going to now take those plants and I can't cross it back to Cabernet again. So I'm going to cross it back to, to Zinfandel. Or I'm going to cross it back to Tempranillo or I'm going to cross it back to something else. And when you do that, in that last generation, the progeny from that generation, are 50% that elite variety used in the last cross. So they do take on a lot of those characters. They look very similar, um, not exactly similar. And again, it's the amplographic uh, situation. Uh, there's a lot of variation and you, you could, I could easily convince somebody that those grapes were Chardonnay, <laughs> Cabernet, uh, Zinfandel, uh, Petit Syrah and, and Cabernet Sauvignon. We, we just looked at them and talked about them because they have so much overlap in appearance. And the wines take on some of that character too. So, that's where they came from, that's where they're going. Um, on the downside of the 20,000 grapevines that were finally sold last year, uh, all that money goes to pay the patent lawyers, by the way, it doesn't go anywhere near my pockets. Um, but but uh, of that, that uh, 20,000 or 20,000 vines that were sold last, last year, um, half of them are being sold to people in, in Alabama and in, uh, <laughs> in, in Georgia. Um, and I've been back already and they're completely rabid back there. They're unbelievably fervent apostles of growing, growing vinifera grapes and they can't, right? Because they die of fierce disease. They can spray on a seven day basis to keep the plants alive uh, from fungal diseases back there and they do, but they, but they, cannot, uh, they cannot overcome fierce disease. So they're, they're very excited. The hill country of Texas is very excited. And there's a few people in California who are very excited. Um, and, and we haven't got PDF in Washington yet, but we could work on that if you'd like. Uh, no, 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 keep your down there. I have the solution now, right? This is the classic caper. You, you, you uh, find the solution and then you, and then you poison everybody and you're the only one with grapes in the end. So, <laughs> so no. anyway, that's where no, we're at. No, 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 no. So, um, a couple different questions. One, um, since we went back to the beginning and the Fertile Crescent, do we know what, where grapes came from? Did they evolve from a different kind of fruit? Um, that's a good question. There's a whole family, of course, in the grape family, Vitales, and there's a family within that, within that, so there's groupings within that too. I have some really cool uh, Vitaceae in, in, in the yard. Uh, the one that's a succulent that looks like a great big weird jade plant with massive leaves, and it's just flowered. They look nothing like grape flowers, but they produce berries. Uh, and they have tendril every so often on them, which is pretty cool. And they're very close to the grapes. And that's probably what the progenitors are. They grew all through it. They still grow all through Africa, mostly in Nibia and Southern Africa. But they're really fascinating plants, really, really cool plants. And there's a whole bunch of other ones. In fact, there's a, I think there's something like 400 different species of Cissus. Uh, you know, kangaroo ivy, the house plant? That's a Cissus plant. And it's, uh, uh, there's a huge number of those. So, so that family 
is, is uh, temperate more or less. It's this big temperate band that goes right around the, the planet. Uh, it's not so tropical, so it's on either side of the tropical band. And there's a lot of materials that are, that are um, uh, in the great family of that, that whole distribution. Sort of the cool thing about the, the distribution of vitus is that it's found in, in Central Asia. And the, the wild types, uh, wild type vinifera is Central Asian primarily, although we know we have wild type vinifera uh, all, all through the Mediterranean and it was moved by people you know, and, and they, they drag it around. So it's not really uh, wild in that sense, although the birds did a pretty good job of moving it in the first place uh, to, to distribute it well. And in China, there's something like 30 species. Uh, back before, no, no one, when, when the Americans didn't know that China existed, we thought there were three different species of grape in China. And now we know there's something like 30 to 40 different species. So there's been a lot of work done on them in China and they're, they're very interesting. And I'm gonna tell you something really interesting about them in a second. And the, uh, and the other big groupings in North America where there's somewhere between eight and 30 different species. And, and taxonomists can be lumpers when they put species together and, and make it, try to simplify in that sense. And they can be splitters when they try to move them apart and, and see how they fit together in that, in that regard. And I've done both. I've looked at it both ways. And I'm now becoming more convinced that there's only eight species in North America. And 30 is for the losers. They're, they can't figure out how to separate them and divide them anyway. But they're all hybrids of each other. That's the cool thing. because they, they, they come together uh, and, and at, the, at the margins and, and produce new species um, that are designated species over time, but at first are just confusing. So it's, uh, it's sort of cool. So we've been doing a lot of powdery mildew work on the same lines as the PD work. And we're getting to the same point. We're about uh, probably this year we'll have we'll have 97, 98 percent vinifera material too. And we, this took a little longer because we knew that PD resistance is not as stable. And, and we actually don't know that PD resistance is stable either. But but powdery mildew uh, resistance is not very stable. But it's genetically very flexible. Uh, the resistance is, and it's evolving very rapidly. So it, it makes it. Uh, difficult to, to work with. The exciting part is there's lots of forms of resistance and that's the funny thing. So if you go back and look at your viticulture text in there, it says that powdery mildew and downy mildew are North American diseases primarily in the eastern part of, the, of, uh, of North America. Uh, wrong, <laughs> because there's resistance in the Central Asian vitus. There's a lot of resistance in it. Uh, and all through China, the wild species are also quite resistant. In fact, we have pure vinifera, and there was a discovery made in Hungary about 20 years ago of a, a form of vinifera that, that resists powdery mildew pretty well. And we've gone back and gone through all, almost stuff and all sorts of other collections that existed here and there. And we've identified about 20 different accessions now that are, that are resistant to powdery mildew, completely resistant to powdery mildew. So if you want a crummy grape that's sort of like a table grape and sort of like a wine grape, it doesn't taste very good, but it resists powdery mildew, uh, that's where to look. So why would we use that in breeding? Because it doesn't have any really negative flaws. So all of the other species that resist powdery mildew have pretty obnoxious fruit characters, very bitter, very stringent, uh, strange colored. And it's, so it's sort of hard, hard to move forward with that material. Although we have to, because we're trying to get as many genes all together as we, as we can. So it's, it's sort of fun. That, those will be coming out soon too. Okay, so then we have, okay, well, real quick, if you have succulent grapes, Becky loves succulents. So can we get her when Corona's over and we can come down and pick up some grapes? Can we, can we get some like succulent grapes for her to propagate? Um, they don't propagate all that well, <laughs> but I'm going to have, last year I, I sprouted one seed out of 15. And um, uh, this is a really neat plant. In fact, I have a bunch of them. They're different species of Cyphostema. And um, I can save some seed and you can sprout them. And the plant is now about a foot tall, not, not bad. It, it develops a codex, which is this great big swollen base. It's pretty cool. They're really, really neat plants. If you like succulent plants, they're, they're one of those things people quest after. Um, uh, if you water them once between October and May, they will die. That's like her kind of plan. <laughs> if you don't water them from May until October, they'll die too, though. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> you have to learn which, how to treat them. Yep, exactly. Okay, so um, can you talk about clones a little bit? Clones, yeah. Clones is all bogus. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. We have to make some big changes. The climate is definitely becoming erratic. It's, it's hard. I guess politically, it depends on how you, what, what, what word you use to describe the climate. But erratic to me is probably one of the better ones. 
and clearly odd things are happening. It's been over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the Arctic three times in the last year and a half or two years. Phenomenal. Um, weird things are happening. So we're going to have to make some changes to grapes. And people say in the press, they always try to corner me when they call and say what's going to happen with viticulture if the climate changes. And I said, well, what do you think? If we're still going to have wine and we're going to make it wine from different varieties. They go, well, won't we have to move all the wineries in the wine growing districts? I said, how likely is that to happen? You think about the billions of dollars that have been put into advertising these key spots on the planet that are supposed to make the best, best wine, the greatest terroir. Um, that they're going to remain, but they're going to have to change the varieties to adapt to that climate. And they're going to have to change the marketing strategy to convince people that these really are good wines. It's not uh, just something peculiar. Um, and they are, they're, it's not so hard to produce them. But the problem is no one started doing that yet. And I spent my whole career on resistance to disease because I thought it was a more important uh, problem. Um, and maybe I, maybe I was wrong <laughs> on the climate change again. But we could easily augment the acid color, uh, uh, ripening profiles, bloom dates, all those things would be very easy to change. And in backgrounds, it would be indistinguishable from, from classic wine varieties if that's what we want to keep drinking. So that's, that's the good and the bad news sort of in a packet. Um, so where do clones come in? Clones came in because of the French. Any of you people, the French, went to Patriots and everything <laughs> before I proceed any further? It became from the French, right? So the French wanted to rule the wine world. They have for a long time. The, the uh, International Organization of wine, Vines and Wines uh, is, is a French organization, and they sort of dictate the economics and the policies and actually some of the science of, of uh, viticulture and, and enology, which is sort of interesting. And they decided that, that they should have, that, that French varieties should be the dominant varieties. And they're really the driver behind why we have 10 important varieties. They're all French. They're all from moderate climate French varieties. <laughs> and they're pretty closely related, a lot of them as well, which is, again, very interesting. So if you're not gonna, if you're gonna stop breeding, and breeding started up again in a huge way during the Floxor crisis, and it was sort of misdirected. That's a much longer story. But there's a great book, if you haven't read it, called The Botanist and the Vintner. It's a fantastic book. It, should, it is required reading for people to come in my class now, <laughs> and they don't read it anyway. But it's a really, really interesting book, and you should, should take a look at it. It's fantastic. It describes the whole history of the Foxer crisis and how, how we got out of it and the different approaches to it, the politics of it. In there, it claims that the, the European train system is actually a byproduct of the Floxer crisis because they had to ship methyl, uh, methyl, methyl bromide. They had to ship carbon bisulfide all across Europe to try to blow up. Uh, they were really trying to poison, but they physically blew up the Floxer in, in vineyards to try to control it for a while. Uh, and that was really the, the whole train system developed from that. Uh, and I guess it makes this, the sense if you think about how it all functioned together. So that's where that came from. And so where do the clones come from? Well, if you only have 10 varieties, you're gonna get bored pretty soon. So there has to be something you're improving. And it's clones. And clones really started with <clears throat> my predecessor, Harold Omo, uh, and, and a guy named Gunther uh, Stout, uh, Gunther uh, Alevelt, sorry, uh, in, in Germany. And they got together and said, you know, there seems to be a lot of variation in these plantings. And how can we get rid of that variation? Um, when we grow out our Riesling or, or whatever variety they wanted to look at, why aren't every single one of those plants exactly the same? They're clones. They're from one set of source of genes. What's going on? And they were interested from both a, a mechanical perspective and from a, a plant improvement perspective. So if we, could, if we could find that variation and define it, then we can move forward with it. Or conversely, we could take that variation and, and try to reduce it and make the varieties more typical. Uh, typicity would occur uh, for, for, for each of those attempts as well. And they did both things and, and both approaches became important. The Europeans primarily went towards the, let's try to generate diversity. We, we can't, we've convinced the world there are 10 important varieties, we can't produce any more. Uh, let's, let's, let's make sure we get some more, uh, a little bit more character or something else to these, these uh, wines and, um, and, and look for clones of them. And they're real, clones are real, no doubt. They're not very stable. Uh, the environment has much greater impact than clones as, as you've seen already on your hillside vineyard there. The environment is the driver of all this stuff. Um, uh, soils as well, terroir, whatever we want to call it, but it, at least the soil environment has a very large role as well, as does the microclimate uh, above those plants. So all those things play, play a role in, in development. Um, they worked for years trying to generate clonal diversity, and most of that was done with x-rays, and there was a big, big uh, um, 
era of insanity in the, in the late, late 40s and early 50s, uh, where people started radiating all the plants they could find to see if they could develop, develop some different plants from them. And I don't know how many geneticists were killed, but certainly not many plants were created from that, that effort. And grapes were in there too. They, they tried to find it and didn't really work. We used a lot of things like tetracycline and all sorts of things to, um, um, other teratogens, sorry, not tetracycline, other teratogens to try to come up with ways to change these, these um, uh, varieties too. In the end, um, we have a lot of clones and we have very little uh, information about how they're the same and how they're different <laughs> is, is not very clear either because the environment has a bigger role than the genetics does on, on changing these things. So no question clones are real, no question they have different, make different wines. And I think the only way to approach them is to find four or five that you really think are unique and make uh, blendable size lots or, or, or um, harvests out of them. So you can at least work with a ton of grapes and say, okay, here's how they work together, here's how they don't, here's what really typifies that variety. And follow them over time to convince yourself that they're stable or not. <laughs> they usually are not very stable. Um, it's interesting. And, and the French now have moved slightly, so slightly beyond. The, the first effort at looking at these things was really from a disease perspective, a viral disease perspective, and a clonal propagation perspective. And they had to number or code the plants that they treated in a given way to, to, to designate them in some different way to, to keep track of them. And that's where clones came from. The clones were really done from a, a disease perspective, not from a fruit quality perspective to begin with. And then they moved on to fruit quality. And in the end, those Entov clones that you pay so dearly for, the extra 25 cents or whatever it is, each one of those clones in the Entov collection is worth pretty close to $100,000 in terms of research support and funding. Um, and so there's the other bugaboo about why we don't have more clones. It's, it's very expensive and it may not be worth anything. At the same time, it would be very simple and very fast and very easy to breed new varieties. And you just have to accept the fact that it has a different name on it. And you could even decide what four or five attributes you'd like in that variety and, and, and work towards that uh, without much genetics, <laughs> without any. All you'd have to have is a good palate and a good eye to, to, to move forward to. So, Andy, when you say they're not stable, do you mean they are going to change over time? I know, I know the soil and the environment, but, but over time, do they change? Yeah, they change over time, too, which is okay. interesting. And most of them are in, uh, most of them have to do with transposons, uh, these jumping genes that Barbara Flintstock discovered years ago in corn. They're really cool. They leap in and out of the genome. So they, they find a sequence that they like and they replicate near that sequence and they pop in and out. They take that piece with them and, and restore it back again later on. So mutations never revert. And yet if you've grown any of the Pinots, uh, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, you'll notice that, that yeah, wait a minute, this is not staying white. <laughs> this is gone to gray. It's not gray anymore. It went back to white. Worse yet, it goes from purple to, to white and back to purple again. Um, so that's, that's, that's not normal for a mutation. They don't restore themselves. And these are not normal mutations, but there's quite a few of them in grape. And they do pop in and out of the genome pretty, pretty readily. Uh, so that, that, those are definitely not very stable. They're relatively stable. We've gotten rid of the ones that are hyper variable, but, but um, that's what we're left with what we got now. You know, I think the other thing that, um, especially being in Washington, uh, we, people here are starting to talk about clones. Pinot producers talk a lot more about clones, but nobody talks about rootstock. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in, when I was working in California, I worked in a vineyard where we had a couple different clones and a lot of different rootstocks. And the impact of the rootstocks on the, how the vines grew was significant. It was much more significant than the difference in the clones. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, and so I think that's one of the cool things about Washington. And although this may be changing with the uh, discovery of phylloxera last year. Um, you know that I found it there 20 years ago, you know that for right? I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> we got tested last year and we they still didn't find any in our vineyard. So um the fact that a long time, but it doesn't that many generations and it's doesn't like the sandier soils, of course, or textured soils very much either. Right. And so the fact that we've got these own rooted vines means again they grow they grow differently, but there's so many different things that impact how your vines grow. And I think clones is a it's kind of that geeky sommelier buzz that people like to talk about, mm -hmm. but um, yep. there are much more impactful things, even in the plant itself, like rootstock in most parts. Yeah, rootstocks have a huge impact. You could easily shave 
uh, 10 days off a given ripening period or maybe add it to one as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty important tool to move the uh, play around with climate as well. Are you seeing people changing their rootstock choices in other parts of the country because of climate change and just yeah, think droughts it's, and things like that? I think it's mostly directed at, at drought right now and in availability of water. That's going to be huge. Um, water will not become more available because there's too many people. <laughs> well, unless COVID could help with that. Who knows? It gets worse and worse. <laughs> but right now, there's still too many people. And um, uh, politically, I think, and environmentally, water is not going to be allocated towards wine grapes. Uh, I think you'd probably keep the gar garbanzo beans growing first, and then wine would come somewhere later on. <laughs> it's just not that critical. Politically, it would be difficult to convince the population that you should be spending as much money on wine. Uh, saving wine grapes and, and vineyards and wineries as, as you would uh, wheat or corn or so soybeans or anything else. Um, sort of the difference between horticulture and, and agriculture, right? Agriculture, uh, people survive with agriculture, but they make money with horticulture. So it's a different, different sort of perspective too. Yeah, that's going to just going to change. There'll be some differences in, in rootstock. They're available already. People have been using them already, but the site overcomes the rootstock difference oftentimes too. So if you give all 10 different rootstocks, 15 different stocks, and rank them from high to low in terms of almost any character. And you, and you put them on our soils at Davis and you give them a lot of water, they're all exactly the same. Uh, if you restrict water, they're very different, right? On the exact same soil, same climate. But it's, it's the availability of water in that case. And it could be soil depth and soil uh, texture too that would cause the same thing. So um, it's an interesting, Davis is an interesting place to learn about viticulture because one of the things that as we've talked about every week that's really important is not giving your vines too much water yeah. and especially at this part of the season when your canopies would be growing your grapes are growing the great thing about washington is that because it's so dry and we have these very low moisture holding capacity soils we can really control our berry size and our canopy size and davis is exactly the opposite of that <laughs> Well, we have a couple of big problems in our defense. One is the students don't come till October 1st. <laughs> now they don't come at all because they're all virtual, <laughs> virtual coursework. Um, so we've got to keep the fruit hanging. It's not good fruit, but it's hanging. There's fruit there that looks like grapefruit, grapes, uh, grape berries. The leaves don't look quite so good most years, but the fruit can be maintained. And you can only do that with dumping water on it. So that gives you a bad impression right off the first. It's, it's not definitely not a good thing to do. Uh, and the other problem we have now in the new vineyard is that the Puda Creek, which is just a big green cesspool, leaches from where it is underneath our vineyard now. So the first few years it was easy to contain growth uh, with, with dripping, drip irrigation, appropriate irrigation, and now they're just taken off and, and they're growing like weeds, literally. That's strange. <laughs> so um, are the Davis... Uh, Paul asked for the Davis clones numbered or some named, and I would also ask what are the names of the new PD Pierce's disease resistant clone? Like, what are we, what would we look for? How would we know that they're in the marketplace? Um, well, they've just become available from nurseries and they're all, they're all sold out this year. Three years ago, the nurseries got a pre-release of them and started bulking them up and only three nurseries took the offer and now there's six nurseries. <laughs> Um, they're the cincture point. That's the difficult part because they have to be convinced that the, they're worth something and that we can sell them and they can make some money on them. It's not like the plant breeder says, go forth and multiply, they'll be fine. Um, they have to look at it realistically. And so that's a, sort of a rude awakening to some extent. Uh, but they've picked off and they're going to be okay. They've all, they're sold out. And the, when the nurseries see that, they'll plant more of them. So they didn't plant a whole lot to begin with and they'll, they'll start quintupling and uh, doubling their, their efforts pretty soon. So the new names, let's see, there's Ambulo Blanc, there's Paciante, there's Caminante, Caminare, and Errante. And how many of you speak Spanish? Ah, ah you do. Did you notice the trend? Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> Who named them? I named them. <laughs> so I thought I would have some fun because first of all, they weren't French names, they were Spanish names. And, and second, and, and worse yet, I named them with a uh, with a noir or a blanc if they're white or, or black fruited. So that was that was interesting. They're going to get mad at me. Um, I don't think the T, the TTB will stop me, but probably the OIV will. Uh, we'll see later. And all the rest of them are derivations on Walker. So uh, I thought it would be amusing to try that. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> 
put that down. <laughs> That's that's fantastic to name all of them after yourself. Yeah, well, it's not quite after myself, just the concept. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Ed asked, where did our vines originally come from? Oh, we got them from a nursery in Washington State. Um, it is important to get vines from a nursery. It's important to get vines that are certified to be disease-free and that you actually get what you what you think you're getting. Um, some people will do suitcase clones where they go to a vineyard in different parts of the world and they say, oh, you've got a block of this and cut some grape wood and bring it back and propagate it and plant it in your vineyard. That's not necessary. You didn't necessarily get what you thought you got. You may have brought back diseases and a lot of these viral diseases will persist in the plant. And so unlike the goal with COVID is that we eventually get either through herd immunity or vaccine, we get resistance and antibodies and we can get rid of the virus. Great viruses stay in the plant and they will, they get worse. They depends on, you get more or less expression of the virus depending on the vintage, but you can't get rid of them. And so you really want your disease, your vines to be disease free and nurseries are by far the most important way to do that. Establish yeah. rapport with your nursery too. Yeah. And be interested in your plants. Uh, show some interest in what you're buying. It helps a lot. Yeah, Washington's got a big uh, clean plant initiative going on. We've got virologists at WSU working on all of the different um, diseases and red blotch is the emerging viral disease that uh, people are talking about and so the if you plant your vineyard and you have clean plants these things can spread um, but they spread much quicker if you have them to start with if you <laughs> if you start out with clean plants and all of your plants are virus free and disease free and you don't have cross-contamination from different vineyards, especially where we're at, because we are not close to other vineyards, there's not as much contamination from your, the insects will bring, or for Pierce's disease, it's a sharpshooter that, it's a bug that will go from one vineyard to the next and take diseases from one vineyard to the next, or PD comes from oak trees, if I remember correctly. Um, more hosts than non-hosts, in fact. Most, most vegetation in, in riparian habitats has Pierce disease. Okay, well, we don't have riparian yeah. habitats, so yeah, we're safe. Because okay. <laughs> we're in the desert. Yep, exactly. Um, but, so if you're, if you're in an area that's more like a Napa, where you have vineyard, 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 things will spread, whereas one of the, our opportunity is that there's not a lot of vineyards around. Our challenge is that there's a lot of orchards, so we have a lot of birds, so we'll have to net everything so the birds don't eat all of our grapes but um it means that if we have clean plants we have a better shot of keeping those plants clean and so it's th there is a much stronger effort in washington uh in the last when did they start the clean plant initiative five ten years of really not only doing this but educating all of the growers and making sure that we all we all understand the importance of having clean plants for the future of the industry and the quality of the grapevines and the, the quality of the wines and everything else. And no, we don't have to worry about our pronouns with which grapes we're using, Paul. <laughs> it might help. You might help to sell them. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> There's a question about the numbers, the clonal numbers. So. There's a whole bunch of different uh, numbering systems and they all relate to this idea that if you're going to do something to clean up the plant, either treat it with heat, you could we actually cook the plant essentially, or treat it with some chemical or, or um, micro meristem it and repropagate it. There's all sorts of ways you're going to look at these things to eliminate the viruses, but you have to keep track of what you do. And that's where those numbers came from. Um, and the Davis clones, we're, we're actually very careful not to call them clones because they have no clonal uh, evaluation. Uh, they're clean and they're genetically pure-ish, um, but they're they're not they're not ever tested for any sort of growth or or fruit-producing capacity or, or wine-producing capacity, and that's where the French 
and most of the European material when, that they call clonal is in fact been through some sort of um, uh, careful food evaluation. That's where that cost comes from. <laughs> it's extremely expensive. So we just number them, hope for the best. Can you uh, define micromere simming for people? Because I'm going to guess. Sure. Actually, it's important, what because, you mean? particularly for you guys, because uh, there was a whole generation of plant material that came through Davis and was spread up and down the coast and across the country uh, that was typified as being clean because it was tip cultured. They took the two tips and regrew the plants and then demonstrated that they were free of disease that way. Uh, but they were actually not free of disease. They started free of disease. But if you have shoot tip culture, uh, about an inch, inch and a half long, uh, those plants that are generated that way are free of crown gall. So crown gall is endemic uh, to grapevine. It's in all the grapevines, essentially. Uh, it causes no disease in California. It causes plenty of disease in Washington, wherever we have cold enough winters. And we generally see very little effect of it, so we don't worry about it. Uh, and it slipped through the program. Uh, then it got into this phase where we use the shoot tips, and the shoot tips uh, do nothing to eliminate virus. So uh, they got rid of the crown gall, but they didn't have any impact on, on the viruses in there. So that we have a generation of stuff that has a fair amount of virus in it. Uh, no crown gall, but a fair amount of virus in it. And then we went to micromere stemming, just taking the literally uh, half a millimeter of the, of the apical dome of a shoot and reculturing that into, into a new plant. And that's free of all the viruses we've seen so far. Unfortunately, uh, the more you manipulate plants, the greater the chance that it may not be the same clone again, right? Because it could actually change the genetics and the genetics within that, if there are all these transposable elements and they're hopping around and, and, and uh, changing, uh, it, there's a chance that they won't be the same clone any longer. So the French are appalled that we do this because they've spent all this time visually and, and carefully eliminating the virus from their materials and then evaluating their fruit and wine quality and we've willy-nilly gone through and, and mowed down all the viruses, but we may have mowed down what made them uh, CAB 337 or, or, or Pinot Noir, take your, take your choice. Uh, they may be not the same thing, and it would be extremely difficult to tell you whether that was true or not. In fact, I think probably pretty close to impossible. So there's really no way to distinguish those, those clones except by bookkeeping. Okay, well, we're going to take a second to uh, give a little cheers to our assistant winemaker there. Sure. Ani, can you hear us? Wave. <laughs> so Anya's nine. She's in town this week. And uh, Sebastian's six. And uh, Sebastian likes driving around on the farm in the on the four-wheeler. And Anya, Anya's been helping me in the winery since she was two and a half. Right? Not bad. And so she's written a book about she's wine wrote, making. Written, she wrote a book about winemaking, and I'm going to unmute you. <laughs> Ani, you can tell us what's your favorite wine, Ani. Anya, what's your favorite wine? What's your favorite wine, Ani? Riesling. <laughs> Which one? Riesling. Ah, good. Good choice. Um, my favorite. <laughs> Sebastian, do you have a favorite wine? Um, rosé. Ah, more generic. <laughs> That's good too. So we all need I to really have a generation of winemakers. I like them all. Your part, this is my part. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And uh, everybody gets to hear about the assistant winemakers. So since they popped up to feed the dogs, <laughs> we have to give them an introduction. <laughs> Mine must be tired because you're really tired because he hasn't bitten me yet. He's passed past meal time. Do you still have that Aussie Shepherd? No, we're on a doodle now. Oh. Lap, Lapadoodle, I think. Or maybe a poodle doodle. I don't know what he is. He's, he's <laughs> the most good natured sweet dog I've ever had. And that's what our main criteria was. He's also fairly large. <laughs> How large? 80 pounds. Oh, that's, 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 a that's, a yeah. that's a starter dog. That's a starter dog. Nugget, um, it's, it's impressive you can't always hear him snoring under the desk, but he's 100 pounds, so. Um, Rumbling. I think if you're going to be in the vineyard, you need a, you need a big dog. Yeah. But, um, okay, do we have, since that was a total tangent, and I <laughs> sidetracked, I know we are over an hour, but since you guys all seem to be engaged and interested, I don't know how much time you have. I'm going to tell you one more thing, and I'm going to dinner. How about that? Okay. So how do you distinguish Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon from Cabernet Franc and, and Merlot? So Merlot has the biggest leaves. Okay. 
It has the widest, most U-shaped petiolar sinus. So the gap around the petiole that goes back to the stem is very U-shaped and very distinctive. It has mostly creamy shoot tips. There, there's a red cast underneath, underneath them, but there's closer to creamy than not. Okay, so those are the main distinguishing features. The clusters all run together, frankly. Um, the leaf teeth and the, the degree of, of, uh, the, of the serration of the dentation on the edge is a little bit different too, but those are the big features. So Cabernet Franc, that petiolar sinus, instead of being a big wide U, is a pinched closed, well, I can't turn my hand properly, pinched closed U, it's almost shut down. Okay, that's that difference there. The leaves are smaller. Uh, they're less floppy. The marital leaves are a little bit towards the North African stuff in some, some regards. Um, the shoot tips on Capri Franc are very bronze red, the most bronze red of all three of them. Okay, and so Cabernet, Cabernet has the greatest lobing. It has a petiolar sinus that actually cups back on itself, so it looks like a hole. In fact, all of the sinuses of the leaf for the five lobes have a hole, essentially a round circle. Uh, it has extensive re-sinusing in, in, the, in the lobes. So you, that sinus is the gap between the two lobes. There's five lobes on the leaves. And that gap between them is called the sinus. And Cabernet, if you look closely, has great big new sinuses on the lobes. And you can sometimes count 13, 14 different sinuses on that Cabernet leaf. The petiolar sinus is round. The shoot tip is closer in color to, to, uh, to Cabernet Franc than Merlot. Um, but that degree of teeth uh, or not so much the teeth, but the, the, the lobing and the, the depth of serration of, of the sinuses is the really key thing that separates them two. And they're not easy because guess what's mixed up more than anything else in the world? <laughs> Those three varieties. My first trip to Chile was amusing. They invited me down to find phylloxera and they, it was all clandestine. I sworn to never, never reveal whether I did find it or not, I didn't. Um, but they took me to see their Merlot block and it was just at the Merlot crisis it hit at that point. So we went and looked and I said, well, yeah, this is not Merlot. I'm not quite sure what it is. And, and, and I looked at the books and said, ah, it's a, of course it's Carmenere. Uh, and so we went to the mother block. This is for Conciotoro that supplies all the, all the, with the, the, the uh, fruiting wood. And it was equal parts, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Carmenere. So they were all there, 25% <laughs> each. Uh, not intentionally, of course, it was all scattered across. Interesting. So the best way to look at them is, is right now. For you guys, maybe you've gone beyond that, particularly with that week of 90, 98 degree weather, the shoot tips will have stopped and you've lost the color, but you won't be able to tell the difference in the colors. So you have to focus in on the petiolar sinuses um, and, and really look at the way those lobes form and the sinus that forms between them. Once you start looking at those things, you can tell them apart, but until then, they're common enough and there's enough variation on the vine so that it's just about impossible. Well, and that's the hard part is that you're not look, all the leaves do not look the same. So you got to look at the right leaves in the right part of the plant and you kind of got to look at all of them and say, what's yep. the average? But, you know, we'll see if we can find some average leaves and, or some good, good leaves. And uh, maybe, maybe on uh, Facebook, I'll do some or Instagram or something. I'll do some. This is Gab. This is Merlot. This is Cap Franc. And so we can do some follow up and you guys can see what they look like. So, and then uh, just pity my poor students who are going to be taking ampelography uh, virtually again. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> oh. They will not be in the vineyard again. They weren't in the vineyard. I taught canopy management for 10 weeks with me videoing lectures, much like this one, extemporaneous and sort of strange, um, uh, in, in the vineyard. And they played them back to them. And they, that's how they learned canopy management, I suppose. I got to say, of all of the so the my first quarter both years at davis i worked in wineries in in napa and the which is not that far uh the first year it was it's about 45 minutes if you're not in the middle of traffic from davis to to carneros and there were lots of classes that it didn't really matter that i showed up for lab and the lectures and didn't wasn't around for much else of it but getting that ampelography, like just spending time looking in the vineyard, it really made a difference that I wasn't there in the vineyard. So I pity your students. I really yeah. do. Um, but um, thank you. I'm glad that you guys are so engaged on this. Andy, it sounds like they want you to come back and talk some more. <laughs> An all-day class at, at, at Walla Walla College years and years ago. Yeah. 
guy's name. He died in, in, in the job just shortly afterwards. Really Stan a nice Clark? guy. Stan Clark. Stan Clark? No, I don't think so. Is that his name? Yeah. Funny guy. He loved the Grateful Dead, so he was driving around. Yeah, that's yeah, Stan. That's him? Okay, good. Uh, Stan yeah. was our viticulturist. Yeah, he was great. I liked him. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. Yep, yep. So. Okay, I'm going to dinner. Thanks. All right, man. well, enjoy your dinner. Thank enjoy you so the rest much. of the bottle of wine. Thank and, you. Uh, we're going for sure because we were going to go on Thursday and um, Viv called for the, to confirm the reservation. They said, we're closed <laughs> on Thursday. I said, what about tonight? We're open tonight. We're closed on Wednesday. So they're shutting down again because people have been disrespectful of the restrictions and movement. Well, I guess, I don't know. COVID's on the track. Hopefully I'm still alive tomorrow. <laughs> Hopefully. We do hope so. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, thank you guys all for coming. We will see you next week. We're doing our progressive dinner at Sunnyside. And uh, Mike and Sue, you're still there. Perfect. Um, we are going, so every summer since uh, Codin and Varietal opened, we started doing the progressive dinner. This year, it was supposed to be next Saturday. We missed it. So this year, we're actually going to do it virtually. Roger, our chef, is going to do a cooking class. And uh, we decided to do it on a Zoom. So next week, we're going to have Roger from Bon Vinos. We're going to have Co from Code and Cellars. We're going to have Chris from Varietal. And we're going to celebrate Sunnyside. So we will see you <laughs> next week. You can drink beer. You can drink Co's wine. You can drink our wine. And there's plenty of choices. Just drink something from Sunnyside, for goodness sakes. Um, and so, yeah. And it should be fun. And it'll be fun. So... Adios. Right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. So Bye. Have a good night, guys. Thank you.